Male testosterone levels are decreasing on average by 1% every single year. Research from 2020 found that since 2006, across all age levels, men's testosterone levels have decreased by 10%. And this isn't the only problem. Levels of testicular cancer are on the crease, male's levels of grip strength are decreasing, and overall sperm counts are dropping. And this got me worried. If you're new around here, my name is Adam McDonald. I am a registered performance nutritionist with an MAC, a natural competitive bodybuilder, and a health and fitness coach for high performing men. In this channel, we try and break down complex scientific topics and turn them into practical applications. So as a relatively young man who's interested in optimizing my mental and physical health and longevity, when I saw these stats I started to become a little bit concerned. So I looked a little bit deeper into the research and what I found that was these drops in sperm and testosterone can be attributed to four key areas. Number one, the rising level of obesity and sedentary lifestyles. Number two, fewer smokers. Number three, increased stress and mental health problems. And number four, external toxins otherwise known as endocrine disrupting agents. Of course, obesity is on the rise, everybody is getting heavier and the number one contributing factor to that is that we're just eating more calories in general and it's pretty well documented that increased levels of body fat aromatize or convert testosterone into estrogen so that's going to have a major impact on the testosterone and estrogen levels of people who are overweight. Smoking actually may slightly increase testosterone levels and nicotine does have some appetite suppressant effects which will lead to people eating less and of course then the aromatizing effects of additional body fat. However, I'm not suggesting smoking whatsoever because we all know how detrimental smoking is to your overall health and longevity. It is up for debate whether we are more or less stressed than we were in previous decades and centuries. However, there is a strong link between psychological stress and increased levels of estrogen and decreased levels of testosterone. The one thing that's not really talked about that often, and I don't really know why, is the environmental toxins or endocrine disrupting agents. Maybe because it's seen as pseudoscience or some tinfoil hack content, or maybe just because we can't really control them at an individual level. Now, I'm not a pharmacologist endocrinologist or chemist and I don't pretend to understand all of this research in this area however I am a health nut and I'm really interested in improving my overall health so this video isn't just to create clickbaits and sensational headlines so I decided to try it out and give it a go so for 30 days with as much research as I possibly could I removed as many endocrine disrupting agents from my overall lifestyle I took blood work before the experiment and I took blood work after the experiment now to save you lots of overly complicated mechanistic science and terms that you probably don't understand and I certainly don't I'm gonna make this really really simple essentially how these endocrine disrupting agents work is that they are very similar in terms of their chemical structure to certain hormones therefore they then bind to these hormone receptors blocking or increasing certain hormones for example it increases the level of estrogen in our body and decreases the level of testosterone and what really got me interested in this area was that I read a book called Estrogeneration by Dr. Anthony Jay and then I started listening to some of his podcasts and interviews and he's laid out some of the key culprits these are, but not limited to, bisphenol A or BPA, parabens, atrazine, phthalates, phytoestrogens, benzophenones, and plastics with certain recycling numbers. And these are found everywhere. Fragrances, plastics, food additives, particular plant foods, receipts, clothing, canned foods, chewing gum, essential oils, sunscreens, deodorants, hair products, shower gels, pesticides, laundry powders, fragrances, tap waters, the list goes on. Now, before I dived into this, I really only ever heard of BPA and phytoestrogens in food because it seems like every second week somebody's arguing about whether soy kills your gains or not. And I think it's important to note that not all experts within their respective fields agree with Dr. Anthony J. In fact, I met my dermatologist earlier this year and I asked him about oxybenzone within the sunscreen that I use. He is one of the leading dermatology professors and researchers in Ireland and he said that it is a conspiracy theory or that the amounts in the sunscreen that we use is not going to have any impact on your hormones whatsoever. And I also read similar rebuttals from other skin researchers on Twitter, but I wanted to go all in. I wanted to go full tinfoil hat warrior and see what the impact was on my overall health. So here's what I did. First, I used an at-home testing company called Let's Get Checked and I selected the male hormone advanced, which checked my testosterone, sex hormone, binding globulin, prolactin, estradiol, or otherwise known as estrogen, and free androgen index, which essentially gives you the level of free testosterone in your blood. I swapped my plastic food containers for a glass, my shaker for a metal bottle, my cans and plastic bottles for a glass, my detergent and softener for fragrance-free versions, my shaving foam for a beard trimmer, and all my cosmetics for natural and fragrance-free alternatives. I even went so far as to filter all of my water and then contain it in a glass jug because, as you guessed it, the filter is made from plastic. The final thing is, I tried to completely avoid walking on carpets barefoot. It might sound a little bit mad, but apparently it can have an impact. So how did I find the one? Well, it wasn't too bad. So upon reflection, I realized that before this test, the main culprits for me were microwaving my food in plastic containers, drinking cans of Coke Zero or bottles of Coke Zero on a daily basis, chewing chewing gum on a daily basis, using plastic 
plastic water bottles or reusing bottles over and over, especially my shaker and all my cosmetic products that I use on a daily basis. The water situation was pretty annoying. I wasn't prepared to fit in a full filtration system into my sink for a hypothesis and bringing my metal bottle with me everywhere was just pretty annoying. In fact, a few times when I was out and I was really thirsty and I wanted some water, I had to go and try and find water in a glass bottle because I really wanted to stick to this overall system of no plastic for a month. I don't consume much soy products in my daily life, nor do I have canned food that often, but I do like a can of Coke and that was something that I kind of struggled with. One or two times I was dying to just drink a cold can of Coke Zero. I also tend not to take receipts when I pay for things just because I tend not to keep them, so that wasn't the major issue, but the cosmetics was. Not only are natural and fragrance-free cosmetics or personal care products really difficult to find and pretty expensive, but they're just pretty bad in my experience. The hair gel that I used made my hair feel oily and greasy. The mineral sunscreen that I used made me look like I was wearing some white layer of foundation. And using a bar of soap and fragrance-free shampoo to wash myself just simply wasn't as good as the regular stuff that I would have used. But worst of all was the deodorant. In the middle of summer, trying to use a fragrance-free roll-on deodorant just doesn't work. Most of the time I found myself spraying normal deodorant onto my clothes just to cover up the smell. None of these are major deal breakers though, and they just made life a little bit less convenient. So here's what everyone's been waiting for, the results. Now, as you're aware, I only did this for 30 days. I would have really liked to do this for much longer. However, right after taking the second round of blood work, I traveled through Ireland, through Spain and Portugal where I am now. So it just wasn't practical for me to continue on this project. So for some reason, when I got the test results back, they didn't include estrogen and prolactin. So they are omitted from this test and we're just gonna have to rely on free androgen index, SHBG and total testosterone. If I had more time, I would have ordered another test and got those numbers as well. So my total testosterone went from 12.8 nanomoles per liter up to 15. That is a 13% increase across 30 days. My sex hormone binding globulin remained pretty much the same. It's slightly increased. But my free androgen index, or essentially a measure of how much unbound testosterone you have in your blood and the testosterone that you can use, increased by 22%. To give some context though, when comparing to steroids, in a 1996 paper, after 10 weeks of using testosterone injected form, basically steroids, subjects increased their testosterone levels by around 752%. With that said though, this is the highest my testosterone has ever been within my overall life, at least from getting it tested. We do have to be mindful of the margins of error in these tests, and every time I did get my testosterone checked in the past, it was when I was dieting for a bodybuilding competition, so a calorie deficit is going to lower your overall testosterone. So in this 30 days, I did keep my calories exactly the same in order not to influence my body composition or my hormones. I don't see much changes in my overall physique, I'll let you be the judge of that, but in 30 days I didn't really expect anything major either because I've been lifting since I'm 15 years old and now I'm 31. I did try to track my sleep with my aura ring but unfortunately it just kept dying on me and I don't really like the aura ring but that is a topic for another day. And overall I didn't really feel any different and I don't think my performance in the gym or at running increased more so than it was before doing this test. And I guess you can put that down to the fact that my testosterone levels didn't really increase to any kind of clinically relevant degree. But I would have been really really keen as I already mentioned to see how this would have extrapolated over 12 weeks. In my opinion, even though I didn't have these life-changing results, I definitely do think there is merit to paying attention to this stuff. Even though there is a lot of scaremongering, I particularly think amongst the cosmetics. BPA, which is one you probably heard of already, seems to be the one that's most watched by health and safety authorities. Recently, the European Food Safety Authority re-evaluated the tolerable daily amount of BPA to just 0.2 nanograms per kilo of body weight. That is 20,000 times lower than it was just last year. And population research from US and German adults found that they consumed about 16 times this amount. But a systematic review from last year suggested 3 nanograms per kilo per day can be safely consumed without affecting sperm counts, which equates to about 100 canned drinks per day. But to make matters worse, often products will say that they are BPA free. Just check the bottom of your bottle or shaker. However, in order to keep their physical structure, these products will contain BPF or BPS, which seems to be just as bad for overall health. To further confuse things, the concentration of BPA changes depending on the temperature that the products are stored in. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. These toxins are everywhere. We are surrounded by them. And even though one of these ingredients may not be harmful for you, it's the compounding effect of all of these ingredients over a lifespan that actually has its effect. Now, I'm not trying to make you paranoid or suggest that you drastically change everything you're doing right now because you're probably doing okay up until now without ever worrying about these things before. So based on the limited research that is out there and my own experience, plus trying to live a normal life, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to drastically reduce the amount of food that I store and heat in plastic containers, swapping that for glass. I'm going to minimize the amount of cans and bottles that I use, especially reusing bottles. And when I remember and it's convenient, I'm going to try and filter my water. Like I said, I think 
it's a case of small doses compounding over a very long time so I'm not going to stress out when it's inconvenient or becomes burdensome to do some of these things. I'd love to know what your thoughts are, what your opinion is on this and if you plan to implement any of these things. If you found this insightful and informative I'd appreciate a subscribe and you might like these other videos that are on my channel.